Hey guys, on today's episode, we're gonna be going over some tips, tricks, and things you need to know before you pick up your brand new car at the dealership. This is a brand new Porsche GT4 RS owned by my buddy David, who also owns Garage 42 up in Massachusetts. At the end of the episode, we're gonna go check out his massive collection. But until then, let's go over some secrets the dealership does not want you to know before you pick up your brand new car. Today on this episode of Drive Protect. Now, before you take delivery of your brand new car, there's a few things that you need to keep in mind with respect to the dealership. When you're done doing the deal with the salesman, he usually walks you over to the F&I department, which means the finance and insurance guy. What his job is to do is to sell you aftermarket products, whether that's paint coatings, whether that's wheel coatings, glass, et cetera, et cetera. In general, my advice to you is to avoid those at all costs because generally speaking, you can buy those services outside of the dealership for anywhere from one-tenth to one-twentieth the cost, especially especially if you do it DIY. In this case, if you were to put a paint coating on, it's gonna be about 1 20th the cost of the dealership. If you say, hey, I don't wanna put that on, I wanna do it myself, then go to a professional. It's about a half the cost of what the dealership will do. And at the same time, that detailer is wildly invested in making sure that your car is protected because they want you to come back. So it's advantageous to do it outside the dealership. Now there is one warranty package that might be worth reading, meaning going through all of the language, and that of course is the wheel and tire package. Now for someone like me who goes in and out of New York City, it is a smart thing to do. However, there is a catch in the warranty language. Sometimes they prevent you from doing that, meaning getting it fixed more than one or two or three times in a time period, meaning six months, a year. You have to read it, it's different for everybody. But I don't have it and I bent my wheel driving into New York City. It's gonna cost me about $275 to straighten the wheel, repaint it, and then remount it on the car. If you do that multiple times, that can add up. So it could be useful to you if you live in or near near a city, so make sure you check that out. All right, the big day is here. You're ready to pick up your brand new car. Now, in advance of that, you've already told the salesman, hey, when the car arrives, I don't want you to do anything other than working on the ECU, meaning remapping that for whatever country you're in. I don't want you to wash it, wax, don't even look at it, leave all the plastic on it. Here's why. When the car gets delivered to the dealership, it tends to have little dings and dents and squirrels and things that just happen along the way. Totally makes sense. Now, the caveat is when they bring it into the detail department, they're going to make that all go away, essentially put lip stick on everything and when you arrive that you go man wow it looks pretty good and you drive away and a week or two later you go what happened over here what happened over there and now they have plausible deniability they go I, I don't know it could have happened on the way down here that or this or that that kind of thing you don't want to do that but let me show you on a graph what happens when the car gets detailed on a whiteboard and I'll show you that they removed sometimes too much paint thus jeopardizing the integrity of your clear coat before you've ever even arrived to pick it up now here's what could potentially happen if your car is detailed prior to your arrival. Right off the bat, we have metal primer base and clear, what's on most cars today. Normally you get a little gouge here, a big gouge there, and some swirls. Again, kind of typical when it's being delivered to the dealership, no big deal. Now here's the nuance. A professional detailer will come in and just barely take enough off the clear coat to remove all these scratches here, and now you have a nice flat surface, exactly what we're gonna be doing right here. But at the dealership, they gotta get these cars out quickly. So they're gonna come in with a backhoe sometimes, and do this, and now you've removed this much extra clear coat. The UV inhibitors float to the surface as they're curing, as they're gassing out. So all that protection, the sunscreen is at the top. And the more that you unnecessarily remove, the more you're jeopardizing the integrity of your clear coat. Here's the kicker. You have no idea when you arrive at the dealership, it just looks clean and perfect to you. That's what you have to keep in mind and why they shouldn't prep the car before you arrive. Now at this point, let's imagine that you arrive at the dealership, it's your big day and the car hasn't been washed, hasn't been prepped, they followed your directions, everything is good. Now put that to the side. On a side note, most of the time you're gonna put it in an email, you're gonna put it in contract, you're gonna talk to the guy and say, don't prep the car. And sure enough, when you arrive, the car has been prepped. Now what you should be thinking in your mind is, hey, ears up, red flag, something could have gone wrong and they needed to prep it real quick, get it cleaned up and back out to you and say, look, it looks amazing. Now that the car hasn't been prepped in this example, the first thing that I do is check the seams. 
I come in here and I want to see the space between each panel. Why does that matter? Now that matters because if they had to replace something, move something, repaint it, they have to usually pull it off the car and put it back on in most cases. And when they do that, it just never seems to fit the right way. Here's a big one. On the front, when it gets delivered, a lot of times these areas get scratched and they have to pull it off. Sometimes they'll paint it on the car, but if it's bad enough where they have to pull it off and put it back on, the clips tend to not fit perfectly. And then the space between the hood and the bumper is a little bit off. So when I do this for my big customers that don't wanna come in and go through this whole process, this is what I'm doing. I'm walking around, making sure everything looks like it's supposed to. Everything fits in. It wasn't removed prior to them picking up the car. Big one is the door here and underneath, making sure the door is opening and closing perfectly. Now this should take you about two to three minutes and it'll really show you if the car has been hit. I know this sounds a little bit like overkill, but trust me, it isn't, especially if you find something that just doesn't look quite right during the inspection. Doing this at the dealership before you drive away will give your argument much more power if it's severe enough to require a repair. Now for step two, shut off the lights. Obviously, this isn't possible all the time at a dealership, but if you have the opportunity to do it, shut off the lights or put it in a corner, that kind of thing. Then you're gonna take a pen light. These are relatively inexpensive. I would call this layman detailing, and you're gonna need it in the future anyway, so these are a good thing to have. Let me walk over and show you what to do with the pen. Now, the reason we turn off the lights is you really only want one source of light to be looking into the paint. It helps you see any imperfections a little bit easier. If the lights are on, it's not the end of the world, but you take your pen light, turn it on, and now most people think you use the light like this, like you point it at things, you don't do that. You actually put it at about 45 degree angle, and now I'm looking into the paint at the light, and I'm moving it back and forth, and this will show me any imperfections, swirls, dings, any touch-ups, drips, anything, and I'm slowly sort of what I call painting the paint. I'm going up and down, and you can see here, there's actually sanding marks. So this is gonna to have to be repaired. And that makes sense. Again, this is paint to sample. So they go really out of their way on paint to sample. It's about twelve dollars to $14,000 option on Porsche. But this is just a stock part. And you can see the sanding marks, meaning they were just moving, turning and moving at the dealership or the manufacturing plant rather. And it needs to be uh, sort of refined. So I have to go in and polish this a little bit more. But ultimately you're gonna go around and look at the paint and make sure there's no imperfections. <laughs> Now, if you're a professional or a hardcore DIYer, there are more tools, better tools, more expensive tools that are used to do inspections on a regular basis. In this case, I have a bigger light, much stronger, has multiple options on it. Then, of course, the paint depth gauges. There's a ton of them. This one's an alcometer. What happens is you use the paint depth gauge by pressing it here. It's gonna make a beep and it says 4.45. This is gonna measure how much paint is above the metal. So there is a little bit of work to be done here. These range from anywhere from four to $500 like this one, or ones can be even cheaper, anywhere from 90 to $120 is about as low as you wanna go. The goal there is to measure how much paint is on the car. Why? If you're doing something like we just showed, four, five, that's pretty normal. Now, if you're going around the car and all of a sudden you hit something that's 25 or 30, Ears go up again, red flag. This may have been in an accident. It may have been hit and there may be some bondo. That's why it's much higher. It's much heavier. There's more paint on it. So your brain's gonna go, hmm, what else could be wrong with this? Is there suspension damage? Is there, who knows? But that's why we use the paint depth gauge. It's sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, like a little x-ray machine that we can quickly use around the car to see if there was any damage prior to when we arrived. <music> Now that your inspection is done, it's likely you found scratches and swirls, but what do you do now? First thing to consider is, how would the dealership have removed those in that process? Would they have removed too much clear coat? Would they have jeopardized the integrity of the thickness of your clear coat? When you go back in and you say, hey, uh, there's scratches and swirls everywhere, you can use that to your advantage. You can leverage that. You can say, hey, can I get some money back? Likely they're gonna say no, but what you can do is ask for maybe a, a second set of tires or maybe lifetime oil changes. Use your imagination. The, the bottom line is, take the car out, go to a professional detailer, have them properly remove the scratches and swirls to know that the integrity of the paint is left intact. Keep in mind, if the swirls and marring is light, I highly encourage you to polish the paint yourself. It's a great way to bond with your car, save some money, and then prep it for protection. Then once again, save yourself even more money by applying the coating yourself. Step one is to rinse the paint. Now, because this is a new car and it's your baby, I see a lot of new owners touching the car with their hand. Don't touch or rub the paint. You're only making more work for yourself or the detailer later on. 
during the pressure wash or garden hose wash, look to see if the water is beading off the paint in the process. This is usually a good giveaway if the car is prepped before you arrive, so keep note of that. Now, as you'll notice here, there's no beading, which is a good thing. We've had plastic on here, we've already removed it. That means the dealership didn't put anything on there. Now, if you arrived, and like we said before, they said, oh no, we did prepare it. This is when you would notice, hey, they put some coating and they put some wax or sealant on here. You're gonna have to remove that before you put your own coating on there. So just keep in mind, when you're power washing, you're not just aimlessly power washing, you're looking at the paint. What I'm seeing right now is a good thing. That means nobody touched this paint before I got here. Next, if you have access to a lift or a floor jack, taking the wheels off can be helpful to reach the inner barrels a little bit easier. If you don't, you can still do a great job with the wheels on, so don't panic. In this case, I'm leaving them on based on the discussion I had with the owner. Next, I fill my foam cannon with Ammo Brute Wheel Soap, which is a little bit stronger than the foam paint soap to help remove as much grime as possible without touching the paint. Your goal is to let it soak for a few minutes to do its work, again, with no agitation just yet. As I mentioned earlier, the owner of the RS also owns Garage 42 up near Boston, and he's looking to hire entry-level and experienced detailers for their multiple car storage facilities, which is awesome for our industry. So I'll put a link down below if you know of anyone looking to detail super high-end cars as a daily job. After a few minutes of soaking, I rinse brute off the paint. Next, I filled the wash bucket with the thick blue wash towel and ammo foam this time for the agitation process. Then, once I was done, I rinsed once again. After the pre-soak to loosen the grease and grime, then we went in and washed the paint and removed all the dirt and dust on the car. So in theory, it's pretty clean, but when I take my hand and go in, you hear that? That's what we call contamination in the detailing industry. And what contamination is, is these particles that basically are stuck to the paint. Now, we just washed everything, it should be gone, but why am I hearing these things? So we're gonna go over to the whiteboard and I'll show you what we're actually doing when we're claying the paint to remove that. There's a little bit of a nuance going on. Let me show you. Clay bars or clay patties are one of the most important tools in a detailer's arsenal to prepare the paint for protection, but there's a few things you need to keep in mind, what it can do and what it can't do. Right off the bat, this is not your kid's Play-Doh, and it is designed specifically for car paint, so keep that in mind. Number two, people think that it's not an abrasive, and in fact, it is technically an abrasive, so it can mar the paint, it can swirl or scratch the paint during application, so we do need to use lubrication. But keep in mind, usually afterwards, I tend to polish the paint because it does sometimes put some scratches in there. Now, look at this here. These red marks are representative of contamination. So when I wipe my hand across the paint, you could hear it, right? Do you hear that? It was catching my glove as I was going back and forth. We don't want to put protection on that because you'll be sealing in the protection over it. Doesn't make any sense. We come in with the clay patty, we go over it, it picks it up. But what's really happening is, is you're shaving off the top of it and occasionally you are leaving behind all the little contamination in the surface of the paint. So I'm recommending we're gonna clay this first and anything that's left behind, we're gonna go back in and polish that out. Sometimes we have pads, foam pads or microfiber pads that will get in there, little fingers that get in here and pull it out. And you've noticed over the years as I'm polishing, I blow out the pad. That's the contamination I'm blowing out of the paint. So now we have clean exfoliated pores in the skin of the paint and then we can go in afterwards and put protection on it. Now, after you've worked a bunch of panels on the paint, you can see that you've picked up some contamination. It can get even worse than this, really black if the car is really contaminated. This is a fresh side, right? And that is a dirty side. You can see a little bit of the contamination there. So when that happens, you have to refold everything and get to a fresh piece until you get a nice flat panel here. And there you go. So now I have a fresh one. I'm gonna dunk it back in my soap come back in and continue along. So you do have to monitor if you pick up a lot of blackheads or a lot of contamination in this case. Keep flipping this so you don't scratch the paint in the process of claying. Once you're done with the clay and rinse, then dry the paint with a microfiber towel, hydrate, and or compressed air or a master blaster. Either way, the paint must be 100% dry before eventually adding your protection. The master blaster blows out heated air to help evaporation and to safely chase out any trapped or hidden water in the seams. 
They have really big ones, super small ones, wall-mounted ones, and so on. And as a thank you to our viewers, they've offered a 10% discount on any website purchases using the code AMMO at checkout. I'll put a link down below. So the technical answer is no, you don't necessarily need to compound every single car that comes out of the factory. The idea is to do an inspection, let the paint dictate what it needs. Now, if you were to go in and just blindly compound every single car, you may remove too much clear coat in that process that's unnecessary and then just jeopardize the integrity of your clear coat before you ever get in the car and drive it home. So in this particular example, it's kind of interesting. We have two different types of paint here. One is paint to sample. That's a $14,000 upgrade from the factory and the hood is just a standard part that comes on all RS cars. So what I'm gonna do on this is it's really good. It doesn't need a whole lot, but we are gonna exfoliate that. That is uh, removing the leftover stuff that we showed on the whiteboard in the clay aspect of it. We're just gonna pull everything out and get it prepared for protection. Here, I actually have to compound, polish, then exfoliate, just clean everything. It's two different types of paint, but the idea is the inspection is what's dictating it. We're not just blindly going, hey, compound the entire thing, because that would be too much removal of clear coat on the stuff that's already good. This paint's good. We don't need to do a whole lot. So inspections are critical. To remove the sanding marks on the hood, I'm using a straight cut wool pad with my exfoliate polish. After I removed the tape line and the 50-50, you could clearly see this needed to be done. So I had to do the entire hood. As I mentioned earlier, blowing out or removing the contamination and paint residue from your pad is critical to creating a flawless finish in the clear coat. I'm encouraging you to try this yourself if you have the time. The pads and the exfoliate polish are specifically designed for DIYers like you to clean your paint in your driveway without the hassle. I'll have a ton more information in the links below if DIYing is your thing. Afterwards, I followed up with a straight cut waffle weave foam pad and exfoliate once again to jewel the surface prior to applying our protection. I repeated the foam pad polishing on the rest of the PTS blue that didn't require the same compounding with the wool pad as the hood did in order to leave as much clear coat on the car as possible. Well, the short answer is yes, I'm always a big fan of putting protection on your car, but it's really important to understand the differences between wax sealants and coatings versus something like PPF. So wax sealants and coatings, they're really designed for chemical protection. A bird poos on it, you have acid rain, you're running through a car wash, it makes it much easier to clean and it's less expensive. On the flip side, something like this, PPF, paint protection film, also called clear bra, you have to think of it as impact protection, meaning you're driving on the highway, you have a long commute and you get rocks, a little sand blasting, it's gonna absorb that impact and protect the clear coat underneath. So there's pluses and minuses to each. You have to figure out what's gonna work best for your budget. So if you're crazy about protection like I am and you want both PPF and a coating, a big question I receive is which one should you do first? What we're doing right now is we're putting the PPF on first, meaning the paint protection film, then on top of that, we're putting the coating, here's why. If I were to put the coating on first, the PPF is not gonna stick, it's very, very hard for that. The second reason is you're not gonna enjoy those characteristics, meaning the hydrophobic characteristics. You just power wash it down, it's beating all over the place, it looks fantastic. You're not gonna get that because it's under the PPF. So that's why we're putting PPF first and then a coating on top. Paint protection film is incredibly useful, but at the same time, it's also expensive. So we need to go over a few things to help you make the decision if it's right for you. Right off the bat, you can see right here, this is urethane and it's very plasticky. You can see it, you can stretch it. So it goes over the car and you can wrap it around very tight areas, door jams, front, that kind of thing. At the same time, it's between eight and 12 mils thick. That means you're doubling or tripling the amount of clear coat that's on your paint. So if your paint is between four and six, you're doubling that. So you have a lot of impact resistance on the car. Now for me, I offer two services. I do everything from the front of the nose, what we call the front clip. If I were to just chop off hypothetically in front of the windshield, everything in front of it, that's option one, including the lights plus the mirrors. Option two is to do everything like we're doing on this. Every painted surface will receive this and then on top of it, a coating. Now, if you're on a budget, this is where it gets interesting. So I would sort of categorize it as the highest impact areas are gonna be this one here. Obviously, 
the front bumper, I would suggest doing that first because car in front of you spits up some rocks. You're going to want to do that um, just to kind of absorb those rock things. The second thing would be the hood. Third would be the lights. Fourth would be the fenders. Now, the, the area that is most neglected that people tend not to do, but I think they should, I call it self-inflicted wounds, meaning from your own tire, you're going to want to do this area here the lower rocker all the way back here. And you notice on Porsches, they have what's called a shark fin. They put that here because the front tire will spit up. So I like to put it there. And then the lower area here, because if you notice, if you take the camera and shoot it back this way, this sticks out a little bit. And when it sticks out, all this area is gonna get torn up. Well, this is a $14,000 paint job. The gentleman who owns it wants to keep it in good condition. So we're putting PPF on. <music> Newer PPFs offer self-healing characteristics, which basically means very light scratches from improper washing can come out when heat from the sun, hot water, or in our demonstration here, a heat gun is applied to the surface. Because PPF is polyurethane or plastic, heating it up rearranges the molecules and flattens the surface in the process. The best way to sort of think about it is if you scratch an ice cube and then heat it up, the scratch would eventually disappear. For my demonstration, I'm using a wire brush on a scrap piece of PPF stuck to the windshield. You can see the damage inflicted by rubbing the metal on the plastic back and forth. After some heat is applied from our gun, it returns back to its original state. Now this can be really helpful if you have small swirls from improperly washing your paint, but again, just have reasonable expectations of what self-healing characteristics can actually do. Whether you apply it directly to the paint or over paint protection film, step one is to make sure that you remove any oils or grime from the surface. The way that we do that is a mixture of 50-50 isopropyl alcohol to water. You're gonna spray it directly on the towel, then gently wipe the rest of the car. The reason we do it on the towel and not the paint is sometimes, meaning occasionally, the paint is very soft, meaning it's brand new, it just came out of the manufacturer. It sometimes may not like the isopropyl alcohol. That's why we're cutting it 50-50 and not spraying it directly on the clear coat. So just keep that in mind. Spray it on the towel, wipe it down, make sure it's good, and you're ready to go. When you see the rainbow, remove with multiple clean microfiber towels and repeat the steps all the way around the car, boat, or motorcycle. Always remember to go back with a light to double check your work for any high spots or leftover coating after you've wiped the car. As you can see right here, I didn't wipe off the spot and it's what we call a high spot, meaning it cured without us wiping it off. Now, how hard it is depends on how long it's been sitting here. So if it's in a couple of minutes like this one here, I can get away with applying Reflex Pro 2 to a microfiber applicator pad, meaning what we're doing right now, going back in, wiping it, and you can sometimes loosen it up. And just go like this, and it'll loosen up, go back in, re-wipe it off, and you're good to go. Now, this area here, I purposely left for a little bit longer for demonstration purposes, meaning if you left that for a day or two, it is now fully cured. Your next step is gonna to be to take a little bit of exfoliate polish, your favorite polish, put it on there, on a microfiber applicator pad, go in and then gently go back and forth just to get enough. You're gonna need a little bit of abrasive material here. This is what the polish is for. Go in, turn it back over and then wipe it off. Yeah, and the, and the coating came right off. So it's not the end of the world. The idea here is QC, quality control. When you're done, you really wanna look over the paint, make sure you didn't miss anything because otherwise when you go back, you're gonna to have to remove a bunch of the high spots, but it's really not that big of a deal. It just depends on how long it's been sitting. Right off the bat, we can start with Ammo Mud. That is a dressing. That is not long-term protection, but it will brighten it up and it'll look great. But again, you won't be actually protecting that material for long-term. The second thing we can do, which is what we're gonna do on this particular car, is use Reflex Pro 2. Now that is gonna add a lot of protection to it, but at the same time, keep it matte finish, which is the goal for this particular car, and the owner wants that. Now the third option is even longer-term protection, but it's more of a restorative, meaning when you have, let's say, an old Jeep that has really old fenders and you wanna bring it back because they just faded in the sun, then we can use Frame Pro. Now that is a towelette that you need to wipe on. Now the caveat with that one is you have to, you must make sure that's absolutely clean. You can use Titan 12 degreaser, go in there with a little scrub pad, make sure it's very, really clean. You can use isopropyl alcohol. You can wash the car multiple times. The mission is to not have any oils or grease on there. If you put Frame Pro over grease, it's not gonna stick. So there's multiple options. My recommendation is to either use Reflex Pro or Frame 
Supreme Pro if you're looking for longer term protection. If you're looking just to go out for the weekend and have a little bit of trim that's faded, mud will work as well. Now there is a big difference between paint coatings and wheel coatings. Now the paint coatings tend to have more flex agents built into the liquid so that it can expand and contract when it heats up and cools down over winter and summer, those types of months without cracking or fracturing in that process. So you wanna keep that protection. On the flip side, wheel coatings tend to have three to five times the amount of solids, making them more rigid than the paint because it's not flexing as much. Plus you wanna have higher heat resistance because obviously you have the brakes here. And then of course the resistance to the hot shards, meaning brake dust coming off on a regular basis. So there is a difference between the two of them based on how much abuse each gets. Well guys, those are the few tips for taking delivery of a new car. Speaking of delivery, we gotta take this up to my buddy David up at Garage 42 in Boston. So I get to drive this with 20 miles on it all the way up to Boston right now. Plus, he has a surprise when we get there. Let's head up. Good to see you. Hey, this thing looks awesome. It looks great. It drives great. 160 yeah, a, miles I put on this. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, you have a good drive up here. Yeah, and it sounds amazing. When you downshift in this, yeah. it's like no other car. This place yeah. is absolutely amazing. We have a beautiful car behind us right now, but I can see that there's a ton of cars in there. Can yeah. you give me a tour? Awesome. Yeah, no, no problem. And so this location stores about 40 cars, and then that new location stores about 200 cars. Wow. So it'll be really cool and, and awesome to see. And we're doing four high car stackers in there as well. So oh, it'll, no. be a, it'll be a pretty, pretty awesome site. That is cool. You have unbelievable cars here. Pontiac, that's one of my favorites. Yeah, that thing's awesome. It's clean still. This is good. Yeah, this car's uh, really cool. Memories. Crazy. An LFA, uh, one of the cleanest Tahoes we've ever seen. I think it has 16,000 miles on it. And he stores it too. That's nuts. Oh my Chevy gosh. Family. That is brand spanking new. Actually smells new. So what's the story behind this? Yeah, so this car is super cool. We, um, we just recently brought brokerage services in house. So our uh, sales manager, Sean, just helped our customer with sourcing this car. It was previously owned by one family from new. Wow. So it was owned by someone's grandfather, got handed down to their son and then the grandson, and then it was the grandson who just sold it. To, Clearly uh, to they're driving customer. it, there's bugs everywhere. I love it. So thankful that you were able to come up here and, uh, and take a look at this. Obviously our, our goal is to bring detailing in house and we appreciate your help in helping us find that detailer. But in the meantime, helping us uh, take care of cars like this. Well, we'll help you find awesome. somebody and this, this is a good surprise. Pretty cool. All right, let's give this thing a wash. Taylor, this hey. looks amazing. Thank you for my surprise. You know, people are like, you got a surprise? What did you get? I'm like, I got to wash a 300 SL. You know, so yeah, yeah one was a good cool. story too. I'm yeah. sure our customer is going to be super excited and hopefully he'll uh, take it out this weekend. Absolutely. Uh, before you head home, it would be awesome to show you our new location over in Acton. Yeah, let's take a look. Yeah, let's go. So this is our, what we're dubbing is the Garage 42 West location because it's west of Boston compared to our other location that's north. And so this was a ground up building that we're building that will be uh, open in September to store 200 cars. Unbelievable. I hear streams. We came over a bridge. There's a train here. It's like Fort Knox of cars. Yeah, it is a really unique property. And when we saw it, we realized it was the perfect property for car storage. It is literally surrounded by a moat. It's got train tracks on one side. There's one way in, one way out, super secure. There's even a house on the other side that we might have an employee live in as the gate master to make sure oh, wow. nothing can leave here without, uh, <laughs> without our permission. Um, so it really was the perfect site and uh, made the perfect fit for a second location. Give me the tour. This building was built using a system called the Murox system that was developed and built by the company K&M, who's the biggest trust manufacturer in the world. 
So like these are, these are bar joist trusses. So this building came in already assembled on trucks as full height panels that were 16 feet wide. Wow. And there would be like eight of them on one, on the back of one truck. And then a tra crane just comes, picks them up, puts them in place. They already had the steel structure in them, the insulation, the exterior siding was already in them. This interior siding was already in them. Some of the windows were already in the panels as well. So the building structure went up in like three weeks. This Detailing over here bay? is the wet detail bay. This will have a garage door and be sealed off with power washers, no getting the rest of the floor wet or anything. Um, perfect spot for that. And this detail bay uh, is for doing all the paint corrections, maybe interior vacuuming. Uh, you can actually see there's a couple pieces of plywood covering up flush oh, mount yeah, and yeah. ground uh, uh, car lifts, maybe somewhat stolen from uh, your shop. I like it. They'll be able to come in, pick up their car and take it away on the weekends if we're not here. So really they can access their car anytime. They're just going to give us a heads up so we can stage it here. Uh, we also got a car lift here and this will be a bit of a maintenance bay with um, tire changing machines. We can change tires on site. Ah. One of those things that every car guy yeah, is always yes, used to have yes, in their that's garage. That's a dream of mine. Again, this is absolutely amazing. I'm really excited for you. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks for coming by. It was awesome to show you and we'll have to have you come back once we're, uh, once we're completely done and once there's some cars in here. Yeah, maybe we do a little bit of detailing, but hopefully you'll find some guys in, in the meantime. Yeah, definitely. And if anybody's interested, uh, just check out our website, garage42.com. You can see all the jobs that we have opening and also inquire about storage if you've got a car that you want us to uh, take care of. Of course. Well, guys, there you have it. If you have any questions, you know where to find me, Larry at AmmoNYC.com. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.